Rumpelstiltskin always says that magic comes with a price. But for this price, you can get a nice piece of jewelry. Use code ONCEPOD for 10% off your first order at Unusual Magic Jewelry on Etsy. Click the link in the description. Hello, and welcome to the Once Again Podcast. On today's episode, we'll be focusing on Once Upon a Time, Season 1, Episode 12, Skin Deep. This episode was written by Jane Espenson and directed by Milan Shalove. It premiered February 12th, 2012, and had a viewership of 8.65 million. A brief synopsis, after Mr. Gold's house is robbed, Emma keeps a close eye on him when it looks like he wants to track down the criminal and dole out some vigilante justice as payback. And Valentine's Day finds Mary Margaret, Ruby, and Ashley having a girl's night out. Meanwhile, in the fairy tale land that was, Belle agrees to a fateful deal to give up her freedom in order to save her town from the horrors of the Ogre War. I just wanted to say this episode on the Blu-ray featured audio commentary by Jane Espenson, the writer, and Robert Carlyle, aka Rumpel Mr. Gold. Oh, I'm so excited to see that now. Yeah, well, we have uh, a bit of trivia. According to Jane Espenson, right right from the beginning, uh, the episode was originally meant to be about Rumpelstiltskin choosing power over love, but this eventually evolved into a story where he rather than choosing power over love, believes that no one could ever love him. And uh, that was right in the beginning. And the title card... You can actually see that vibe, to be honest, because oh. it's like you could kind of tell shift occurred at some point. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the title card features Rumpelstiltskin's spinning wheel for the second time in the series. And the episode begins at Sir Maurice's castle, the town of Avalone? Or I forget how they say it in the episode. It's not Avalon, but it's uh, another town. Lands under attack in the Ogre War. They have sent for help, but it has not arrived. Suddenly, help arrives in the form of Rumpelstiltskin, who offers them a deal of his protection of the town in exchange for Bell's servitude. Bell agrees to his terms. Gaston, who is engaged to Bell, and Sir Maurice, her father, are against the idea but the deal has already been made. I have a few notes about this scene, like Rumpel pointing out that he makes gold, so them offering him gold. He said he needed something more special, and he points to Belle and says You know what's interesting is this Mm. happens so frequently, like where people being like, I have gold, I have riches, don't you want that? And Mm. he never does. And it's always, but I make gold. Mm -hmm. Like, And surely people know enough about him to summon him, so they should know that that he doesn't need their money yeah yeah it's a very odd thing yeah and it's interesting too these ogre wars that keep popping up it just seems every i mean rumpelstiltskin at this point is a couple of centuries old but there was an ogre war that when he was human he was involved in and now there's another ogre war these ogres man so what's interesting about it too is like remember how i said like when we were talking about when Rumpel got the Dark One power and it, that the Ogre War was going on, but I said, why doesn't the Dark One just get rid of the Ogre War and deal with it? Mm. But here we see Rumpel do that. Like mm. he, you know, they basically say, hey, deal with this war for us, like protect our people. We'll give you whatever you want. Yeah. And that works here. So I question why the Dark One before him did not do that. Yeah. I like also, when it's clearly they're capable of doing it. Yeah. I, I also wonder what, he does exactly does he go to the ogres and say knock it off does he kill them all does he just snap his fingers and there's a magical wall that they can't get past now i would be interested to know what he actually does yeah we don't see that so there was audio commentary from carlisle and he said he was able to come up with the rumple character because he did a lot of theater mask work literally like wearing masks while on stage so the makeup and the contacts that he wore worked as his mask for the Rumpel character, and that Rumpel's voice was inspired by his six-year-old son's voice. 
Fascinating. Yeah. You also missed the uh, Belle and Gaston gay engaged, and oh. we can add to that the uh, craziness that is her father owning a castle all of a sudden in this Beauty and the Beast retelling. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a big departure, not only from the Disney version, but even from the original, the original version. story. Yeah. 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 But there's some cut content here. After Belle says to her father that he could be on his way right now, Sir Maurice's line was supposed to be our offer has been too small, which they just cut it from the episode. Well, it's uh, an, an important. Mm-hmm. And this was show creator Adam Horitz's favorite moment of Belle and Rumpel when the couple first meet. So he was on set the day that they shot this scene. I do love this. I love this entire episode. Oh, I yeah. love anything involving Rumpelstiltskin and Belle, but it's like, uh, I didn't realize we were getting close to this episode. So watching this episode, I was like, oh, we're at, we're at that episode. <laughs> yeah. First season, first impression, like the first time I watched it, by far my favorite episode, even throughout the second season, I think it was still stood as my favorite episode. And it's one of my favorite overall I feel like now that we're at the back half of the season two, we're like, all these episodes are just like, even the ones that are like singularly character driven by like one character, they're mm-hmm. so good that just they're also good going forward for the most part. So moving back into the episode in Storybrook, Mr. Gold repossesses Mo French's van. <laughs> what, what a name, Mo French. Um, <laughs> Regina insists on speaking with Mr. Gold immediately. But he requests that she please delay the conversation. And at the cafe, David Nolan and Mary Margaret are talking when Emma Swan arrives to ask about Henry. Ashley Boyd arrives and Ruby asks if they would like to go out for a girl's night. Emma declines the invitation, but suddenly receives a phone call from the station, which I wonder who was calling her. We never see anyone else there. She receives a phone call from the station stating that Mr. Gold's house has been broken into. Mr. Gold arrives home to find his house's front door wide open. As he enters, Emma is already inside investigating. So, you know, you were like, oh, I wonder who calls Emma. Obviously, there's just a forwarding service that the phone calls from the sheriff department Mm. goes to her phone. That's my assumption of how that works, because you're you're right, who is calling her? But I assume it's just like a forwarding service mm, probably like a beeper or something you know yeah it just directs it right to her cell phone i have a few notes on this part i wrote taking mr french's truck on valentine's day when he delivers flowers mr gold just loves torturing this guy mr gold shutting down regina with a please oh uh, i knew you were gonna be so happy to see that oh, too oh yeah ruby asking david and mary margaret if she wanted to push if they wanted her to push the tables together like they were sitting at separate tables but talking like trying to pass off that they're not there together granny loves holding ashley's baby like a, oh like i a know godma- granny loves is so excited yeah she just has this huge smile on her face while she's holding the baby mr gold on being robbed he says i'm a difficult man to love which cracked me up and then there's a few notes from the commentary Espenson said that she named Moe's delivery truck Game of Thorns as a joke to herself because she had written episodes of Game of Thrones but didn't think it would actually make it into the episode They're like because it's a different network and everything. Yeah, and she, that's, that's great though. Yeah, they both discuss that the fans like Gold because he takes on Regina, who's the big bad for the season. So it makes Gold look like an anti-hero in the fans' eyes, which I think is true. Uh, also, just... The fans love Robert Carlyle. That the, too. Yeah. The book that David and Mary Margaret are reading is Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. And it is a novel about a marital affair that ends tragically. I was going to make that the comment too. Yeah. And they're reading Anna Karenina. Yeah. The final, like, which he says, like, I hope it has a happy ending or something <laughs> like that. Like, like, like oh, David. Yeah. yeah no. Well, well, also, most people probably haven't read Anna Karenina. And David with his new memories definitely hasn't read it. So, you know, and the commentary the final bit of commentary notes was both Carlisle and Espenson discuss how gorgeous Megan Ori or Ori. I'm not sure how her last name is. Ori. Ori. How Megan Ori is. Uh, She's the actress who plays Ruby and that she was actually cast out of Vancouver where they shot the show, uh, which, you know, they said most people think you have to, 
get people from LA and fly them up to wherever you're shooting to have good looking people, but she's proof that, and I, I just, you know, with my Ruby joke going, it just made me, uh, when they mentioned it, I was like, Oh, yep. Here it is. So I do have a thing here, but only because, so I'm going to preface now the book chapter from the once upon a time reawakened book is very different mm. from the, this, uh, episode and there's an added little scene in the book where David literally tells Mary Margaret that she shouldn't go on this girl's night thing at all he hates the idea and he thinks it's a punishment to him oh wow (laughs) wow like very well toxic masculinity right there (laughs) I'll bring it up there was a cut storyline from this episode I didn't really know where to put it I have it in my trivia at the end, but there was a cut storyline where David and Archie go to the bar that Mary Margaret and all of them are at. And it was about like the two single men, uh, even though David's not single, but it was about the, the two of them on Valentine's Day. And basically David was just watching Mary Margaret there. But yeah, yeah, right. that seems that actually in the book too with Archie oh, and David. So oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, very, very toxic masculinity. You're right. Back in the Enchanted Forest, Belle is thrown into the dungeon of Rumpelstiltskin's castle. He lists all of Belle's tasks, and then he jokes about one of her duties, skinning kidnapped children. She accidentally drops a cup of tea, which chips. I have two notes here that we have Geppetto's parents in the background. And in the commentary, the scene that they shot was much longer, but it, uh, it had to be cut for time. Actually, the original cut of this episode was uh, 60 minutes long, which would have been a full hour. And most, yeah. Yeah, most hour-long television shows are between 48 and 53 minutes for precious commercial time. But the scene had Rumpel showing off and explaining all the things in his collection to Belle, which included the Golden Fleece from Jason and the Argonauts, a wizard hat that could have either been the hat from Fantasia or the sorting hat from Harry Potter. That's a quote, uh, according to Espenson. And also a lasso, which Robert Carlyle said was Wonder Woman's golden lasso. Wow, do I wish we had gotten that scene. Yeah. Netflix, can we get like a redo of this entire show? Well, I don't, you know, it's interesting because ob- like they would have to talk to Warner Brothers about using the sorting hat and also yeah. using Wonder Woman's lasso. So I don't, I don't think that there was, a, you know, it's a reason why it got cut. Anything else you'd like to add or no? No, I, okay. I had the Geppetto parents note as well, okay. but that, All right. that's it. So back in Storybrooke at Mr. Gold's house, Emma mentions a neighbor after noticing the door was open, phoned the station about the issue of Mr. House's Mr. House, about Mr. Gold's house being broken into. (laughs) Mr. House is a character in Fallout New Vegas. So give me a little, I I screwed it up, but you know, whatever. Um, Nope, they're just a Mr. House in this world now. (laughs) Yeah. She threatens to arrest Mr. Gold if he doesn't tell her what he knows. He accuses Mo French of robbing his home and Mr. Gold threatens him. So my only question for the scene is who lives next to Mr. Gold? My question is, where does anyone live? Because we never really get a map of who lives where. Is this kind of, you know, I assume he lives in a big mansion. He lives in a big mansion the same way Regina does. Yeah. The only thing from the commentary that they pointed out about this was that both the outside and the inside of Mr. Gold's house is pink. But that was like a common thing with, uh, I forget the like New England style homes built in the style that Mr. Gold's yeah. house is but like they, they they are painted in ornate colors like pink and blue but like very light blue and stuff back at the dark castle while trying to open his drapes Bell questions why Rumpel spins straw so much as he already has so much gold she pulls too strongly on the drapes and falls off the ladder but Rumpelstiltskin catches her and then he agrees to leave the drapes open my notes here are, are Rumpel saying that spinning helps him forget to which she asks him like what are you trying to forget and he says oh I've already forgotten so it must have worked and then Rumpel about the curtains there's no need to put them back up I'll get used to it uh, I think it's like a subtle way of showing the fans he already likes that he having, cares yeah yeah. And, yeah he likes that because he doesn't do anything for anybody it's his way or the highway 
And then I have two notes, two further notes. Carlisle saying that when Rumple caught Bell, it was the first time in a long time that he touched another person. Which, well, of course. That, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And a bit of cut content was uh, after Bell comments on the mirrors being covered up, Rumpelstiltskin's line was supposed to be, there's other reasons why a mirror might be covered, which didn't make the final cut of the episode. Which it really should have, because we see why he has the mirrors covered in reality later on in the episode. Yeah, it lets the audience be smarter than the, the original line was giving them credit for. At the sheriff's station... Emma has recovered the majority of Mr. Gold's items, but he says there is still something missing, which upsets him. He goes off after Mo himself. Uh, in the commentary, Robert Carlyle said the one thing that he wanted to show up in Mr. Gold's shop was Paul McCartney's guitar. And as of the recording of the commentary, it has not shown up yet. So I don't know exactly when they recorded these commentaries, but seemingly it was before this series ended. And... I don't believe Paul McCartney's guitar ever shows up in Mr. Gold's shop. I don't think so either. <laughs> no, but I'll keep my eye out for it. Yeah, I don't have any notes for this. That was pretty, it's a pretty straightforward scene, so. Okay. In the Enchanted Forest, Belle asks Rumpelstiltskin why he wants her there. She asks him about some clothing she found upstairs, and he tells her it's his son's. She wants to get to know him, but to keep from giving too much away, He jokes in a fit of self-deprecating humor that perhaps she is trying to find the monster's weaknesses. She tells him that he is not a monster. Gaston shows up and Rumpelstiltskin turns him into a rose, which he gives to Belle. He asks her about her choice to come live with him. She tells him she did it to be a hero and to be brave. He asks her about Gaston and she tells him she never cared for Gaston and that their marriage was arranged. He allows her to go to town to preclude further questioning. And in response to her surprise that he is letting her out of the castle, he responds that he expects to never see her again. By now, it seems that he has fallen for Belle. I I really love this scene, but (laughs) I think it's so funny that, you know, we talk about Gaston being the real villain in, you know, the animated version. And Mm -hmm. here we kind of have that being twisted pretty severely in that he's being just turned into a rose when he shows up to save Belle. Yeah, and the line that Rumpel tells Belle is that it was an old woman selling roses, which is like, you know, kind of a twist from the Disney version. Yeah. And in the commentary, they also mentioned that there was a cut storyline where both Rumpel and Mr. Gold had an assistant who worked for him called The Dove. And the dove was played by an actor, a very large actor who was six and a half feet tall. And he can still be seen in some background shots with Mr. Gold uh, throughout the series, but he's mostly been cut. And I I just found that interesting because he, you know, it would seem like in the, in Storybrooke, he should have people working for him. Not necessarily, not necessarily in the Enchanted Forest, but in Storybrooke, he should. Interesting. Yeah. While out in Storybrooke, Ruby tries to convince Ashley to get another guy since Sean Herman is always working. David is at the pharmacy getting two Valentine's Day cards when he runs into Mr. Gold, who is buying rope and duct tape. (laughs) Mr. Gold kidnaps Mo and ties him up in the back of his van. At an undisclosed location, Mr. Gold takes Mo out of the van at gunpoint. So David buying the two Valentine's Day cards. Interesting. One for his wife and one for Mary Margaret. In the commentary, Robert Carlyle said, this is the episode most people talk to him about. They said that they identify with Rumpel and always thought that they were unworthy of love, but this episode changed their perspectives. Espenson said that people tell her that episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, another show that she wrote for, got them through high school. And, Interesting. And there was also, according to the commentary, a cut storyline where Gold would misdirect Emma in her search for Mo French so that he could get to him first. And a bit of trivia, in the episode The Price of Gold, it is established that Ashley is 19 years old, yet she is shown drinking at a bar here, even though the le- legal drinking age in Maine is 21. Good point. 
So I have a few things. Hey, the bar is called the rabbit hole in the book. Oh. I don't know why all three of these women look like they're dressed to going different places. Uh, Ruby's the only one dressed like she's ready to go for a night out on the town and yeah. find a man or do have a good time. Mary Margaret looks like she's going to like a middle school dance or like a semi-formal, you know, junior prom. Ashley, I don't know what she's doing with her outfit. I'm not going to lie. It's the top and shorts. She's wearing shorts. We see that it's shorts later on. Yeah. Well, I, think... I have questions what they all thought they were doing. I think I think their outfits kind of reflect their characters a little bit. Ruby is the social butterfly of the group. She keeps leaving and going up to different men and talking to them. Mary Margaret's kind of just sitting there the whole time. And Ashley is there, but she doesn't really want to be there. And this is the scene, like we mentioned earlier in the book, where they see that David's there with Archie and Mary mm-hmm. Margaret just ignores him and feels that he is stalking her. Oh yeah, which which also she's... they do talk about Doctor Whale in the book oh. and how Mary Margaret's like, yeah, I'm just not interested. And Ruby's like, I don't know, you should keep that up. <laughs> yeah, he he is a doctor. Um... Pretty much Ruby's thought. <laughs> yeah, but back in the enchanted forest, Belle is walking down the road when she runs into the evil queen. They talk, and the queen asks her if she is running from someone. She also asks Belle if she loves her employer. The queen tells her any curse can be broken. She suggests that Belle kiss him and tells him that true love's kiss will break any curse. Which, in the summary it had here, that might explain when Graham kissed Emma, but I'm not a fan of that idea, like why Graham's curse started to break, because Emma and Graham weren't in true love, but... No. Yeah, moving on. Belle returns to the castle, much to Rumpelstiltskin's surprise. He is plainly pleased. He has been watching for her from a tower. And when she returns, he runs downstairs to his wheel to appear that he has been spinning nonchalantly rather than waiting for her return. She asks him to hold true to his promise, and he tells her about his son. He asks her why she came back, and she kisses him. The curse begins to fade away. Rumpelstiltskin pulls back, shocked and angry. When Bell says that she said that true love could break any curse, he realizes the queen planned this and thinks that Bell has been working for her. His anger comes from his self-loathing as the curse returns. He shakes Bell and shouts in her face that he knew that she could not have been genuine because no one could love a monster like him. He throws her back in the dungeon. So in the commentary, there's a couple things. Oh, do you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say that. So when it comes to Regina and early on being like with the dark curse and no, telling her that true love's kiss can break this spell. So she knows true love's kiss can break everything, mm. but she seems shocked in the first episode or two about the dark curse being broken by anything, that it can be broken at all. Mm. When she knows that every curse can be broken. Like that's a known fact. Yeah, it's a weird uh, contradictory thing for Regina. Uh, I agree. But I have a few notes about this scene from the commentary. Originally, the scene with Regina and Belle talking took place in the Queen's carriage, but it is a one-person carriage, so they reshot it as they thought it was too comical because like, the two of them were jammed into the carriage talking. <laughs> And Robert Carlyle requested that Gold have heavy eye makeup to reflect his counterpart, Rumple, which I, I thought was interesting. And uh, Jane Espenson made the joke. She was like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't realize that they put heavy eye makeup on you. I just thought maybe you're born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. But, uh, it, you know, it, it was a little line that they said that made me laugh. And also, when Rumpelstiltskin is looking in the mirror, there is a unicorn tapestry in the background. This is the same tapestry that can be seen in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I do have one other thing, just, you know, because we didn't mention that when he's literally screaming at the mirrors, when he uncovers them, because Mm. he's talking to Regina through the mirrors, because he knows she could see through the mirrors, which is how we know from earlier that that's the reason he's keeping all the mirrors covered. Mm -hmm. It's so that Regina can't see what's going on. Right. And use that against him. And Which just establishes more that she's the big bad here, that it's not him, even though 
he theoretically has way more power than her yeah than she could ever have to be honest yeah well yeah and you know he's immortal essentially and regina isn't yeah but he's got lots of power that she doesn't have also i'm going to mention it later well in an upcoming just in the next part but robert carlisle also mentioned in this scene and the next scene he had to give about a 50 50 percent performance because they were so physical he didn't want to hurt his partner that he was working with like when he was shaking bell like and they stopped he was like are you okay like you know i just making sure he didn't hurt her when he was shaking her in a cabin in storybrook mr gold threatens mo's life he wants to know where the missing object is and who told him to steal it his anger grows and he strikes mo with his cane repeatedly he says that she is gone forever and that it is his fault and that he was her father Back in the dark castle, Rumpel smashes things in a fit of anger and grief and picks up the cup with a chip in it, preparing to smash it as well, but stops himself and sets it down. At the cabin, Emma shows up to stop him from further harming Mo. So this was a very emotional scene for me, you know, cut back and forth showing both Rumpel and Mr. Gold being upset. Yeah. The line... Mr. Gold's line to Mo French, my fault, what are you talking about, my fault, was Robert Carlyle's idea. And as I mentioned, these, these were difficult scenes for Carlyle to shoot. And he said he had to do it at about 50% because he was worried it would be too violent, both for his, his partner that he was doing the scenes with and for family audiences viewing it at home. I'm just imagining Robert Carlyle at 100% now beating somebody down. Yeah. I, um, I don't what? know. I don't know what kind of actor he is, if he's a method actor or not, but he, you know, he might have like actually beaten Mo French with his cane if he was or something. I don't know. So I do have an interesting thing here is there's a scene in the book that where Emma is actually looking at all the land and property holding holdings of Mr. Gold, which explains how she got here basically and hmm. why she, she was looking at what properties Mr. Gold had and then decided that that's probably where the cabin is where he was hiding Mo French, but that she was at Granny's while she was doing this. And Henry does show up there because he has some time while his mom's not looking. And Henry tells her all about Rumpel and Belle. And then she leaves just in time to stop him, basically. Mm. Okay. So that's how they fill in the backstory of Rumpel and Belle. Yeah. In the cha- okay. Because you've mentioned before that like Henry kind of does the story. Yeah. Henry often fills in every once in a while, a chapter in the book will be like an enchanted forest chapter, but mm. most of the time we don't get the same like back and forth. We just get the storybook line with a little bit of Henry thrown in to tell us what's actually going on. Okay. Interesting. At the bar, Ashley is sitting alone, still feeling down, and she tells Mary Margaret that she wants to be with Sean. She considers breaking up with him, and Mary Margaret understands what she is going through. Just then, Sean shows up and proposes to Ashley, which she accepts, and they kiss. David finds Mary Margaret outside. He gives her a card and tells her that he doesn't want her finding anyone else. He accidentally gives her the wrong card, and Mary Margaret tells him he should go home. Back at the cabin, Emma questions Mr. Gold and places him under arrest. God, this episode makes me hate David. The next oh, episode yeah. doesn't really do it any better, to be honest. No. It, the next episode makes me, like, charming more, but not David for certain. Yeah. I mean, screwing up the Valentine's Day cards, that's, that's just a rookie move when you got two women in your life, David. But And it makes me wonder, did he give Catherine... The one that he went for Mary Margaret. No, because he pulls out the other card and goes, this is the one oh, for you. you're so right. Like... You're right. Yeah, that, that's yeah. true. Yeah. I also have written here that Sean proposed on Valentine's Day, which I thought was pretty tacky, but what are you going to do? And that Gold's, in the, according to the commentary, Gold's cabin is the cabin that David, Mar- David and Mary Margaret stumbled into to avoid the storm. It did look similar from the outside. I didn't really notice the in- interiors that well. But... I didn't feel the interiors look the same, but I did think it was supposed to be the same cabin. Mm. How many cabins in the woods are there? I Endless. I don't know. <laughs> in, in Storybrooke, maybe maybe not, but I don't know. There's no, that's not a, that's a mansion, not a cabin. And we'll get there when we cover it. <laughs> I was thinking of someone else. 
In the Enchanted Forest, Belle is sitting in the dungeon when Rumpelstiltskin enters and allows her to go free. He tells her he doesn't want her anymore. She tells him that he could have had happiness and calls him a coward. He tells her that his power means more to him than she does, which she says is not true, and he will regret his choice. She tells him that all he will have is an empty heart and a chipped cup, and she leaves brokenhearted. Such uh, a savage line on her part, but I love it. Oh, yeah. My, my question here is there's no way that true love's kiss could have cured the Dark One curse. It's I, not a curse in the same way that other curses exist. I could see if he was like cursed to be evil by something else, but the Dark One is very much like an entity onto its own self mm. that kind of latches on to the human. So I don't really see how that's a curse so much as like its own thing right you basically had to do go full exorcism to get it out of you essentially so i don't really it's not an easy thing to dispose of no and i I know like her kissing him earlier made his lizard face disappear for a moment but maybe it was him coming back to himself like he still would have been the dark one but he would have looked human it could that could be true because i mean spoiler you can take this out that doesn't look lizardy or look weird very true messed up here and there so i can i could see that depending on how you particularly dark one in your life depends on how it affects your physical appearance yeah and like he can change how he looks too also there was commentary the original ending for this shot on rumple looking at the chip cup was much longer in fact he started to cry but it was cut after one tear just started to form and Jane Espenson said that while she wrote the episode, Edward Kissis wrote Bell's iconic line, all you will have is an empty heart and a chipped cup. Of course he did. Like I said, it's a good, savage line. Yeah. At the sheriff's station in Storybrook, Emma talks to Mr. Gold, who is behind bars. She offers him half of her sandwich to repay the favor she owes him, but he refuses. He tells her he does not need a reminder that she still owes him a favor. Regina shows up and gives permission for uh, Emma to go with Henry for 30 minutes to get ice cream. Emma knows that this is to allow her a private meeting with Mr. Gold, but she wants it too much to refuse. Gold invites Regina to sit using the the word please. She wants to talk to Mr. Gold, who asks her if she has what he wants. When she says yes, Gold realizes Regina put Mo up to breaking into his house. She says that she wants him to answer one simple question. What is his name? When he replies, Mr. Gold, she asks him again and what his name was elsewhere. He admits to her that his name is Rumpelstiltskin and addresses Regina as your majesty, confirming that they are both aware of their alternate identities. She returns the chip cup and he tells her nothing between them has changed. So this was the number two use of please in this episode. So I have a few notes here. A, that when Emma's offering him the pastrami sandwich as like, as his uh, favor in the book, it's literally just letting gold out is the favor. And I'm Mm. like, yeah, that makes way more sense. And then the book chapter ends pretty early here. And it just ends with Henry explaining more about Bell and Balefire as well, and then says that Mo French must have been Bell's father. Honestly, Rumple here actually does look a little scared at the end of that scene of Regina. Like it's the first time we kind of see him be a little worried. Oh, like uh, while he's still in the jail cell. In the jail cell. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he he does say to her, it, "It's a call." In my opinion, it's a call back to I think it's Pilot where. He's in his jail cell in Charming's castle. And yeah. she, she comes to see him there. Like, I got, I got the same vibes from that. This, this was probably my favorite scene. No, maybe not my favorite scene, but one of my favorite moments from the series the first time I watched it when he says Rumpelstiltskin. Like, I, I remember I got, like, chills down my spine. Well, yeah, because you go, oh, oh, he actually does know. He is yeah. awake. Yeah. Like, you know, now we know he's awake, so it's not as... Hard hitting, yeah, impactful yeah. immediately. But he's always awake. I don't know. I don't remember him looking scared. I'll have to rewatch it again. But <laughs> I wouldn't say like super scared. But 
concerned enough to be like, huh, he's actually like concerned about the evil queen and what she might do. Like mm. now that she knows that he knows. Yeah. Hmm. We'll have to see how that plays out. I think also this is the second use of please in this episode, the third overall. And I think it's probably the last one going forward. I think so too. Yeah. But Back in the Enchanted Forest, the Evil Queen shows up and asks Rumpelstiltskin to make a deal with her. She wants to talk about a mermaid. He says she will never be more powerful than him. He accuses her of having something to do with Belle, but Regina stuns him when she tells him she had nothing to do with Belle's death. She reveals that because of her time with Rumpelstiltskin, Maurice treated her cruelly when she returned home and locked her in a tower for an exorcism. And she died when she threw herself from the tower. Rumpelstiltskin calls her a liar, but she mocks him by telling him that he should get a new girl because the place is getting dirty. Full of grief, Rumpelstiltskin replaces a golden chalice on a pedestal with the chipped teacup, quietly sobbing afterwards. In the commentary, both Robert Carlyle and Jane Espenson talked about how they love that Regina can just walk into Rumpelstiltskin's castle like what's their relationship? Yeah. And, and I just always took it as like, he doesn't have any guards or anything because he doesn't need them. Like he's so powerful. Yeah, anyone could technically do that. I mean, we saw Gaston in this episode just walk up to the castle like, yo, what up? Yeah, like, and I don't think he sleeps or anything. Like th- that's why he actually spins, if I remember correctly, because he doesn't sleep. To me, it, I just always took it as he's so powerful. He doesn't need anyone there to defend him. And then also... It was pointed out the notable items that Rumpelstiltskin has collected in his spinning room include two dolls, a.k.a. Geppetto's parents, a sword, the sorcerer's hat, a trident, probably most likely King Triton's, a clock, and now a chipped cup. It's the most precious possession when you really think about it. Hmm? (laughs) I would love to see Captain America's shield or something, but actually, I think in a previous episode, we might have pointed out that um, Mjolnir... I'm not saying it correctly, but Thor's hammer is in the background of one of Mr. Gold's uh, possessions, Rumpelstiltskin's possessions, I should say, which how does he lift it? Listen, how does he do anything? Yeah. It's a real question. Regina is seen going through a code locked exit door and down to what appears to be a psychiatric ward in the basement of the hospital. She gives a nurse a rose and the nurse informs her that No one has come to see her that day. Regina walks down the hall and approaches a door. Inside the room is Belle's counterpart locked up in a cell. And in the commentary, they said that the hospital that Belle is locked up in is a reference to one flew over the cuckoo's nest, which I don't think we get it here, but we find out later the nurse's name is Nurse Ratchet, which is a direct reference to it. So yeah. Oh, man. I just remember being like, She's alive. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah, because they changed. You no, know, the... not that we. Not that you really ever think Belle's dead because it's Regina, but like the fact that it's like okay, she is here in Storybrook. Yeah, and they changed the story so much from the original Beauty and the Beast. There might have been a chance that she was dead. So I have here some deleted scenes. In the original opening scene was much longer. There was a shot of a messenger dove battling its way through a storm to get to Maurice's castle and deliver the bad news. And this turned out to be a difficult CGI task, so they cut the segment out. As mentioned before, Mr. Gold had an assistant named the Dove, and his story was cut from the final episode. Uh, Belle trying to escape. Again, a messenger Dove brings news about the (laughs) Ogre Wars, uh, Uh... (laughs) that the Ogres have fallen back and Belle's family is safe. When Rumpelstiltskin is distracted, Belle tries to escape by sneaking out the door, only to find herself entering the same room through another door. Rumpelstiltskin explains to her that she can't escape. And in the well, original- yeah, you're not going to find find an easy way out of that castle. Give me a break. No, and it's an, that's a perfect use of his power too. Like she runs out of the room just to come back into the room through a different door. And in the original script, this segment is part of the scene where Belle breaks the chipped cup. The script contains additional information where Rumpelstiltskin explains that ogres are superstitious and greedy and a few whispers and some gold, the deal was done, explaining how he ended the ogre war. 
When Belle tries to escape, she finds herself entering the same room through another door on the opposite side of the room. And then Rumpelstiltskin explains he took some magical precautions to prevent her from leaving. According to Robert Carlyle, it took two hours to get the dove to land on his finger when they filmed this scene. Just a little interesting thing. And as I mentioned before, the storyline with Archie and David spending time at the same bar, I guess it's called the rabbit hole, as you mentioned, that was cut from the episode as well. There's a segment explaining how Emma found out where Mr. Gold was hiding Mo French, and it was cut from the episode, most likely. But I explained it yeah. in the book, so. Yeah. And if, anything fills else? fills in all the info sometimes. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to mention about this episode or no? Uh, let me see if I got any other ones. No, I just, like I said, this is probably one of my favorite episodes of this season. Mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for the rum bell. Oh, yeah. Gets me every time. That concludes this week's episode of the Once Again Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Any questions, comments, or critiques can be addressed to either our email at onceagainpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at onceagainpod. If you are feeling generous and would like to contribute to the podcast, we have several tiers available on patreon.com slash once again pod. Also, a like and a share would be greatly appreciated. Thank you and have a wonderful day.